We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about His power and His mighty wonders, so the next generation may know them, even the generation not born. And they, in turn, will teach their own children. I'm a mentor. I'm a father. I am a father and a grandfather. I'm a mentor. I am a father. There are no perfect fathers except one. I'm no hero. But he's my hero. You might feel like you're only one person. But it only takes one person. It takes you. I will teach. And I will show him strength of character. I will love her courageously and protect her. I will disciple him in grace. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road. And when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. I will pass on. I will pass on. I will pass on. I will pass on the torch of truth and father their hearts. With God's help, how will you pass on the truth? Good morning, men. Good morning. So we are continuing in the series, The Journey to Biblical Manhood this morning. Before we get too far along, though, uh, let's go ahead and do a shout out. And uh, I'm quite excited about this group. This group has been uh, meeting since 2003, and this is the first time that I've ever even known they existed, or you for that matter. Uh, there are 10 men, and uh, there's a picture there. Of course, a little difficult to see their faces. But 10 men, and uh, they meet with us on Fridays at 6.30 a.m. Uh, they meet for personal spiritual growth and accountability. Scott Campbell is the leader, Shoreline Community Church in Akron, Ohio. And uh, so I wonder if you would uh, join me in giving a very rousing, warm welcome to the men here uh, that are led by Scott Campbell. One, two, three, hurrah. Welcome, guys. We're so glad to have you with us. And uh, I wanted to mention also a couple things to you online guys. Number one is if you are online and we don't know about you yet, we'd love to. So send me an email at uh, patrickmorley at manandmere.org. And we'd love to uh, work in a shout out for you. Uh, then secondly, uh, something beautiful happened this week. Brian Russell, who uh, is our uh, Director of Online Strategies, has been um, taking our one massive web, we have the largest men's discipleship website in the world, uh, too many pages, and so he's been breaking that down into smaller websites over the last couple of years. And uh, Brian, with the, the help of some uh, other people, has um, he's led this initiative and taken all of the archives of the Bible studies and uh, put them on uh, YouTube. So we now have a, a YouTube channel. And this goes out on YouTube every week, which makes it much more readily accessible. And he put together uh, a website just for the Bible study. The Bible study now has its own website, mimbiblestudy.org. And we have a place on the, the website to donate, but a couple weeks ago, Brian decided to try a pop-up, uh, drawing people's attention to the fact that uh, there are 6,000 downloads of this Bible study every week all around the world, and uh, hundreds of groups going on, don't know how many, and encouraging people to make a donation or consider making a donation. So, for example, it takes about roughly um, $2,500 a week to publish this Bible study around the world. Well, we've had a, a very difficult time getting donors to fund the Bible study. 
because what they will say is that we don't feel like we should have to be funding the online Bible study because those are men who should be paying for the ministry that they're receiving. They sh they're getting the benefit of it. They should be paying for it. Uh, they point out, you're not ministering to starving children in Africa. You're ministering to men who ought to be able to pay for it. So we had a, had a very difficult time uh, funding this Bible study, although obviously we continue to do it. And so uh, this week, we had our first significant online donation ever. Somebody out there in cyberspace uh, donated uh, $1,000 online this week to the Bible study. So I was encouraged by that. It's progress. And so I would just mention to those of you who are online to, to uh, check that out and consider that. Pray about that. I really like the, lo the internal logic of uh, people who are receiving the benefit of the ministry should be paid for it. It does make a lot of sense, and so I ask you to give that some consideration. But uh, pretty cool, 1000 bucks online, first time ever. So that was really great. What's that? Makes me want to put up a website. Makes you want to put up a website? Yeah, for 1000 bucks. yeah, that's a, that's a big deal. I can understand why you want to do that. Oh boy, you're really going to need this lesson today, buddy. <laughs> All right, so journey to biblical manhood. Uh, we're moving into challenge number four, uh, fathering, fathering. And so uh, how many of you are uh, fathers? Almost everybody. How many of you are grandfathers? Uh, quite a few of you. And uh, how many of you are... Uh, Hoping or planning to have more children? Raise your hands. A few, a few of you. And, um, or have uh, children who are expecting to have additional ch uh, children? Raise your hands. All right. And so this is really for, for all of us who have children and grandchildren that we love. And uh, so... Um, if your children are doing well, all of your other problems will fit into a thimble. But if your children are not doing well, uh, it will permeate into every aspect of your life. It's said that men compartmentalize, uh, women don't. But if your children are having trouble, you will become a woman. It will affect everything you do. And so fathering is uh, a very significant area. And so on this journey to biblical manhood, which is a journey to become a disciple of Jesus, uh, increasingly spiritually mature in Christ, uh, there is nothing that could be more dear to our hearts than how to father our children. Now, the first thing we want to look at in this uh, challenge are the faith and life objectives and you have cards on the tables that should be on your online downloadable. So we won't allow the responsibilities of fathering and mentoring to be defined by our culture. Rather, at the end of this leg of the journey, three things. I'll understand how to disciple children and grandchildren to love God and others rather than fathering for performance. That's the head. I will have made discipling my children, grandchildren, or mentoring a top priority in my life, that's for the heart, and then for the hands, I will encourage and pray for my children, grandchildren, or mentory every uh, day. So, uh, for, for this first message, uh, the, 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 the title of the message is, Fathering the Heart Trounces Fathering to Perform. And so... Um, You may think that, or you may have thought in the past, I'm sure you don't think still, that you could be a great dad, and who doesn't want to be a great dad? Who doesn't want to be a dad who wins? Everybody wants to win as a dad. And, but you may have thought at some point that you could be a winning dad just because you really, really wanted it. Or just because it was really, really important. Or just because you really, really loved your kids. 
But you have long since realized that that is not enough. I need a volunteer. Kenneth, would you be my volunteer? <laughs> so Kenneth is a uh, former uh, professional athlete. You can tell by the way he's cut this piece of granite that he is. And uh, Kenneth goes 260 pounds, so he's got about 90 pounds on me. But I can kick his butt. <laughs> not really. Uh, n not in this case. Uh, how how many of you are uh, former or current professional athletes? How many professional athletes? Raise your hands if you're professional professionals. All right. How about collegiate athletes? All right. So a lot of a lot of that very athletic people. You know, if you're an athlete, that it didn't happen just because you really, really wanted it. You needed to have skill. You needed to have tools in order to be successful as an athlete. Now, if Kenneth weighed 260 pounds and, and didn't otherwise look like this, he and I work out at the, uh, the gym, different parts of the gym. <laughs> but if he was 260 pounds and, and fat and flabby, I guarantee you that it didn't make any difference how big he is, I could take him. Because I do have skills, I, I'm a trained killer. I am. I'm a trained killer. I know, and, and, and I actually, I know the, every vulnerable spot on his body. So for example, oh, I could just, oh, I could just take him out. I could just, oh, I could just take him out. You see, oh, I just, in fact, I'm just dying to give it a try. <laughs> Except it's Guinness, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, oh, and it's a Bible study, so uh, there's, there's that going on. Now, so what if, what if, what if, you know, Kenneth is standing there and, and we're getting ready to go at it. What if I go like this? What does that mean? You have an advantage. It doesn't mean a thing. No, it doesn't mean a thing. Because he's 260 pounds and he looks like that. He's going to kill me. So having the skills for fathering, having the skills and the tools for fathering, that's how we're going to win. Thanks, Kenneth, for being a good sport. <laughs> And so, I want to make you a promise that uh, over the next three sessions, we're going to talk about you know, how you can absolutely be a winning dad, be a great dad or grandfather, and, and perhaps even mentor uh, your kids or grandkids in that same way. So, uh, first thing we need to talk about is the problem that every dad has to address. Proverbs chapter 22, 25 says, uh, 22, uh, 15, says that folly is bound up in the heart of a child. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child. That's the core issue. That's the core problem. So, um, a few scenarios. Your kids, they wake up on Sunday morning and they don't want to go to church. What do you do about that? Your kids, they don't want to eat broccoli. You know, what do you do about that? Uh, your kids uh, don't want to do homework. What do you do about that? Your kids are beating on each other. They, they hit each other in the arm and sometimes maybe even leave a bruise. They don't want to go to bed. So how do you, how do you address these problems and why are these problems? These are problems because folly is bound up in the heart of a child. So, every one of our children and grandchildren has a dual identity. Because of creation, they are a little like a god. And because of the fall, they are a little like a devil. And so, they are images of God. Uh, but they are also products of the fall. And so, the true heart of your child is that they are an image of God. The false heart of your child, the false heart of your child is that they are a product of the fall. And so, in, in, in the grand scheme of things, the role of a father is to help the child who is born as a, it, it, into sin 
and with a heart of folly to uh, mentor and tutor that heart to the true heart uh, that the child has as an image of, of God. Well, how does God provide to solve this problem? How does God provide to solve this problem? So, in uh, 1 Samuel 16, 7, it's on your sheet. You can look it up later if you want. But, but the, it's the story when Samuel is going out to anoint a king for Israel. And he goes to, the, to Jesse. And Jesse has all these sons. And Samuel sees the, the, the oldest. And he says, wow, <laughs> surely this is the Lord's anointed. He's just a good looking, perfect, he looks like Kenneth, you know? And so the Lord says, no, he's not the one I've appointed. And then he goes to the next son. And he says, no, he's not the one I've appointed either. And so on and so forth and until he's gone all, through all the sons. And, and, and Samuel says, well, don't you have any more kids? He said, yeah, well, yeah, I've got this youngest son, David, but he's, you know, out doing some other things. And so bring him in, bring him in. And, um, um, God said, this is the one that I want you to anoint. And it says in 1 Samuel 16, 7, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Man looks at the outward appearance, but man looks on the heart. And so we find this incredible clue into how to father our children well in this little story. The idea is that we don't merely look at how the child is behaving at the outward appearance, but we look uh, at the heart. And so uh, the big idea uh, today, you know, and, and, and you know, how we get at this, this, how do we get at, you know, looking uh, beyond their outward appearance and what's going on in the heart, how do we get at that with our kids? We get it through this big idea. It's the, it's the father, the heart question. What's going on in my child's heart that's making them behave that way or that makes them behave this way? What's going on in the heart of my child that's making them behave this way? This would be the first question we would be wise in asking when our, when our kids don't... Uh, uh, when our kids are, are, are arguing with each other, I remember our kids used to, when they were teens, they were, they were arguing with each other, and I, I just sat them down one day and said, look, you guys, gotta f you guys have to figure this out. You have to figure this out. You know, someday your mother and father are not going to be around, and they're going to be the two of you, and you're, you know, you're on the, the verge of, of, of doing something, creating such a rift between the two of you that, you, you know, you're not going to be liking each other, you know. Uh, but, but it's someday that you're going to be the only two family members here that we have. And so, you know, when these kinds of things come up, you can try to just uh, focus on the, the behavior. But father to father the heart would be to instead ask the question, okay, What's going on in the heart of my children that's making them behave this way? So instead of focusing on the behavior, the outward appearance, we focus uh, on the heart, all right? And so, <clears throat> I want to talk to you then about uh, the two uh, ways that dads uh, approach fathering, the two ways that dads approach Fathering, and on your tables are some. Uh, I just ended up doing this this morning, so I don't know if this is the best way or not to do it. But uh, you've got these sheets. Uh, you don't have to write this down. You can pick up one of these sheets on the table. But the, but I wanted to just compare to you the difference between fathering to perform and fathering heart, and so that you can have this clear in your mind because this is a. This is a, this is, this is, this is a, this is the big idea in parenting. To, when you father to perform, you're looking at appearances. That's 1 Samuel 16, 7. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. Fa to father the heart means that you're, you're uh, looking beyond appearance 
to what's going on in the child's heart. Fathering to perform focuses on the child's behavior. Many fathers try to get their children to, uh, why should you do this? Because I said so, that's why. Um, how many of you had that going on uh, to you and from you? So um, the idea of focusing on uh, getting the, the, the children to do the right things, but without looking at what's going on in their heart. So yes, you can get your children to conform uh, because you said so, because you have the power to control them for a while, but if you never actually get at what's going on inside their heart, then uh, that behavior will obviously slip away. Fathering the heart pays attention to both belief and behavior. My wife, Patsy, one day was talking to, uh, she's mentored a lot of young moms around this town, and she uh, one day was talking to a young mom who was concerned about how she could keep her children off of drugs. And in the course of the conversation, Patsy says something very interesting. She said, said, I am not primarily interested in my children's behavior. She said, my, my first concern is what's going on in their heart. That's it. That's fathering the heart. You know, my first concern is not principally, my, my principal concern is not what, what, how, the, what's go, how they're behaving, but my uh, principle or first concern is what is it that's going on in their heart. So do you need to pay attention to behavior? Oh, absolutely you do. But belief determines behavior. Belief determines behavior. So whatever behavior that, and this applies to you too, of course, however you are behaving, you are acting out something that you believe. And so we have to get above. So fathering perform deals uh, or focuses on, you know, what they do. Uh, fathering the heart focuses more on why they do what they do. Uh, fathering the heart is law. Fathering the heart is grace. You know, you can raise your children under grace or law, but grace is better. If you ch raise your children under law, forcing them to conform, controlling their behavior without helping them understand why that's going on and understanding what's going on in their heart, you may get them to uh, toe the line uh, until they are old enough that they can get away from you. And then you are very likely not to see much of them ever again. They will... Uh, be there, you know, maybe at Christmas, but, uh, <laughs> or they may even be there more often, but in terms of them having a deep affectionate relationship with you, you can pretty much write that off, unless, of course, uh, you humble yourself and there's a reconciliation, and by the way, this, some of you are the, the are, are not the, 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 uh, the father in this, you're the child in this, and you know exactly what I'm talking about because you were raised under law, and you know, when you had a chance to get away, you just, you, you bolted, and uh, you, you, because you're, you're, your father uh, was a controlling person and, and uh, didn't have grace. So grace is, you know, freedom, yeah, within boundaries. Okay, there are boundaries. We're not talking about, you know, throwing out the baby with the bathwater here. So, fathering to perform, uh, you can get your children to behave with enough threats of punishment or promises of reward. You can. You can threaten and promise your kids to get them to do a certain amount of things. But fathering the heart, the method there is asking questions and having a discussion. How does a, per, how does a person, if God looks on the outward, if, if man looks on the outward appearance and God looks on the heart, all right, and uh, how, how can a man find out what's in someone else's heart? Only if that person decides to reveal what's in their heart. And since folly is bound up in the heart of a child, the child probably can't even talk about, doesn't have the language, doesn't have the structures to talk about what's going on in there. But you, you as the adult in the room can ask questions 
you know, that help the child to reveal his heart. Okay. And then you can discuss it. And then, again, fathering to perform, because I said so, fathering the heart, let us reason together. Come, let us reason together. I mean, not, not that you're going to say that to your child, but, you know, that's the biblical idea here. And then fathering to perform, what does that do? Well, it perpetuates folly. Why? Because it doesn't impart the wisdom of, of the discipling father into the disciply child. And uh, fathering the heart, though, does produce wisdom because there's this spiritual transfer, this intergenerational transfer of biblical truth from the father uh, to, to, to the child. And then, um, again, the big idea, the father, the heart question. You know, what is going on in my child's heart that's making them uh, behave this way? That's the question to ask. And then, Let's take a little bit of a look at God's plan to disciple our children and do that by turning to Psalm chapter 78. Psalm chapter 78, if you would. And we'll read together a few verses there. So if you're comfortable uh, doing that if, and can find it, go ahead and do that. <clears throat> oh, and uh, <clears throat> I... I never get around to doing this, but I'm going to mention, uh, uh, mention it today. So this is the book, The Dad in the Mirror. And <clears throat> I'll, I'll, most of this message, I suppose, can be found in this book. And so for those of you who uh, want to go further in this, <clears throat> or want to buy a book for your kids or whatever, uh, we, we brought some this morning, so I'd encourage you to pick a copy of this book up, uh, The Dad in the Mirror, okay? Psalm 78. <clears throat> so if, how, if folly is how the child's life starts, what determines how it turns out? Well, in Psalm 78, verse 1, O oh, my people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden from of old. Things we have heard and known things. Things our fathers have told us. So I'm a spiritual man. I'm going to tell you spiritual things because these are things that our fathers have told us. So where did this knowledge come from that we have? Well, it either came from our fathers or surrogates, coaches, teachers, preachers, so forth. Or <clears throat> we didn't get it from our fathers because they didn't have it to give to us. Many of you have given it back up to your fathers, but most of the time it's supposed to come down. That's the way it's supposed to happen. But some of you didn't get it, and so you started out your life caught in a, in a cycle, in a cycle. And you have come to this Bible study or, and or other Bible studies because you want to do what? You want to break the cycle. And you, you are breaking the cycle. You have broken the cycle. So where did this knowledge come from? It came from our fathers. It goes down. Verse 4. So now that this knowledge has been passed down here and in other relationships you have, you know, what will we do with this knowledge? What will we do with this knowledge? What is the purpose of all this knowledge that we gain. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power, and the wonders he has done. There it is. So this is God's plan to disciple our kids. And so uh, why might we not tell the next generation? Let's read on. 
Verse 5, he decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children. So this is, this is God's plan. It's for the fathers to disciple their children. To teach their children so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born. And they, in turn, would tell their children. This is God's plan to disciple our children. This is God's plan to help drive out the folly that's bound up in the heart of a child. Verse 7. Then they would put their trust. Why? Then they would put their trust in God. When we father the heart, they will put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. They would not be like their forefathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to God. So this is God's plan for disciple, uh, discipleship. God is in the process. <clears throat> you can see it happening right now in our generation. God is in the process of doing the last verse of the Bible, uh, the Old Testament, the last verse of the Old Testament, and that is he's turning the hearts of the fathers to the children. You can see the millennial generation in particular, you can see that God is in the process of turning the hearts of the fathers to the children. And so uh, let us rejoice in that. Let us be happy in that. Let us be glad in that. And then, but let's not just, let's just not put them out there making the sign of the cross and doing the best they can. Let's make sure that we take on these skills and these tools that are available to us and help, help every father understand that you are the plan. You are the plan. You are the plan. You are the plan. You, 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 you. You are the plan. And the uber starting point for this is to understand the difference between fathering the heart and fathering to perform, and to understand that fathering the heart beats the crap out of fathering to perform. And the father of the heart question is, what's going on in my child's heart that's making them behave this way? What's going on in my child's heart that's making them behave this way? Okay, now, we have three questions. I'd like you to take some time, go over those questions, and then... Uh, uh, aggregate some of your answers. We'll, we'll have a little open sharing time at the end like we do. And then do we have any first time visitors with us this morning? If you would raise your hand here and here and here and here. Okay, well, I wonder if you would join me in welcoming these men to the Bible study this morning. <laughs> so glad to have you. And uh, we do have a visitor's table, which I lead. I'd love to have a chance to get to know you a little bit. And so if you would, uh, I'd like to invite you to join me at this card table in the front right-hand corner. Uh, thanks. Let's break to the tables for discussion, and I'll give you a two-minute warning. All right, well, let's, uh, let's wrap it up. It's 8 o'clock, and so uh, for those of you who are online, I hope you have enjoyed uh, your discussion. And so, bottom line, we've had a very robust discussion here on a couple of these questions today and some uh, healthy insights and hope you have too. Let us, let's pray. Our, our dearest Father, uh, you are our Father and uh, we would love to be as good to our kids as you are to us. Um, so, Lord, would you come now through your Holy Spirit into our hearts and uh, tutor our hearts with uh, your, the words, your message from today and show us our next right steps and then give us not only the desire but the power to do it. Philippians 2.13, you are working in us both to will or to desire and to do uh, of your good will. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.